So, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Tokyo. And uh, after this keynote speech, so inspiring, we will starting now all together today's reflections on science advice for changing world. What is changing at an accelerated rate we never experienced before? What are drivers? Um, think about geopolitics and geoeconomics. It's changing so quickly today and really impacting our thinking about democracy. Think about new technologies. AI, driver of changes. And what about scientific discoveries? If you look at CRISPR-Cas9, transforming drastically the way we look at our human being and the capacity to interface on human being too. We have a huge number of new business models. Platformer is one of the examples. And also we have people's actions. Hashtag me too is changing the way we perceive our relationship. So are we better off in terms of economic welfare, social justice, democracy, and well-being? Are you sure? We have to ask ourselves, we have positive side and also negative side. Um, some of the example. Um, Surveillance society is not a science fiction anymore. It's almost in place. And it is, if you are using in the right way, it's wonderful. Think about people elderly with dementia. They were able to go outside, enjoy their life. But if you have someone wanted to really manipulate people, you should be careful about that. And Thanks to the advancement of technology and sciences, we'll be able to really catch. You have I inside yourself. We can observe almost everything, and it's, it's good and bad think about misuse of all the technologies. So we see the sphere of interference of human on human being. That's today's situation. So that's why we have, based on the keynote speech, um, we see the raison d'etre of sustainable development goals, giving the direction we have to move together. And there we have science, technology, and innovation, in short, SDI, with hope. And it's, we're sure that it may help to address the challenges identified by SDGs. But also, STI can ha or harm them in un unintentionally or sometimes intentionally. So we hear every, almost every day, STI for SDGs, in short. Uh, it's neither a mature concept nor an eye-catching slogan, but it is really political challenges and the challenges for policy makers, where we are today. So therefore, we need science advice, as advocated by Peter, and followed by us. And that's why we have today five public speakers, including uh, Helen joining us. Thank you very much for your support. Uh, I will just say a few, no, not a few words, but just introducing my panelist. We have Matthew Valens from International Development Research Center, IDRC. Uh, second speaker will be Daya Lidi, International Science Council, ISC, in short. We have Michiharu Nakamura-san from Japan Science Technology Agency, JST, in short. And we have also close times from the World Bank. So we will start with the uh, speakers. Uh, 10 minutes maximum, please keep your time. And then we move to the discussion. So I will invite first Matthew Valens for 10 minutes defending your statements, please.
Thanks very much. Um, I'm humbled, uh, honored to be part of this very distinguished panel. Um, so, so thank you very much to the organizers uh, for giving me this opportunity. Um, I'm also very proud on behalf of IDRC to be part of this grand INCSA um, project uh, that we've been involved in now for, for just over a year and a half. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll keep my remarks very short and maybe just make a few um, very modest points uh, that try to connect SDGs, uh, STI systems, and, and science of ice capabilities with a focus on the global south. So first, just to, to put things in a bit of context and give you a sense of where I'm coming from at IDRC. Um, IDRC, the International Development Research Center, is part of Canada's um, development assistance envelope. Uh, we're an arm's length governmental agency, primarily acting as a research funder, uh, but also focusing on capacity development in the global south, not mutually exclusive, as you can imagine. Uh, and essentially focusing on investing in knowledge, innovation, and solutions to improve the lives of people in the developing world. We have uh, programming around the globe, offices in Latin America, Africa, um, the Middle East, and Asia. And my particular interest within IDRC is on um, STI systems. So that, that's sort of where I'm coming from. Uh, in terms of strategic objectives, uh, I won't go over these in detail. We have three. Um, essentially, one is about scaling up research for large-scale positive change. The second is about building leaders, both leaders in the sense of scientific leaders as well as policy leaders. And the third is about partnering with the right organizations to maximize our impact. Um, and these uh, strategic objectives, along with programming lines that are very much um, in line with, uh, with the SDGs lead to some, some of our flagship programs on food security, uh, Ebola vaccines, uh, the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, uh, which has actually uh, recently launched a, um, a component focused on math for climate change. Um, and then uh, the Science Granting Council's initiative, for example, which is a, uh, a, a collaboration of 15 um, agencies uh, 15 funding agencies in sub-Saharan Africa that, that aims to strengthen their, their, their capabilities to deliver on uh, national priorities and to fund, to fund research that makes sense uh, regionally and, and nationally. Um, and that last example brings me to the, the few points I wanted to make around SDGs and, and research for development. <coughs> so, as I think we, we heard earlier today and we'll hear throughout the conference, mm -hmm. SDGs and research is not just about ticking a box, um, but the SDGs really have the potential to be transformative in the way we think about research, to be transformative in the way research agendas are set and implemented. But this requires capacity. It requires resources, it requires political will, especially at the national level. So programs such as the Science Granting Council's initiative are really about that, enabling funding agencies to set agendas, deliver on agendas effectively through transparent research processes. But when we talk about strengthening research systems, especially in the Global South, we're not just talking about the key, uh, the core funding agencies or the core science agencies, but we're also talking about the broader ecosystem of science, technology, and innovation, especially at the national and regional levels. This includes technology intermediaries, uh, it includes accreditation agencies, uh, it inc includes different faculties within universities, and it includes science academies. And in a sense, what, we, what we're trying to convey there is that this isn't just a policy for science issue, but also a science for policy issue. But one of the problems we're faced with is that there's very little evidence and very few structures and very few networks in place in many parts of the global south that can, uh, you know, that can really focus on science advice and, and that can really enable um, SDG, uh, SDGs to be part of the science ecosystem, 
to put it broadly. And this is where IDR, IDRC's partnership with INSA began last year, focusing on building capacity, individual and organizational capacity for giving and receiving science advice, focusing on strengthening regional networks, and focusing on developing, perhaps most importantly, some of the evidence and understanding of how science advice works in the Global South. So on this last point, <coughs> we launched last year a call for early career scholars, early career practitioners to start really thinking about how does science advice work specifically about, uh, around, around different SDGs in the Global South. So I'd like to just uh, conclude my remarks by introducing the first six of these research associates. Um, Dr. Sesan from Nigeria, uh, Ms. Waresing from Sri Lanka, Dr. Bersi from Philippines, and Dr. Lamari from Morocco, uh, Mr. Berra from Bolivia, and Dr. Nuri Daya from Indonesia. Um, and perhaps if, if you're in the room, I could ask you to just stand up very quickly so people see who you are. And maybe just congratulations to all of you <laughs> for being successful in a very, a very competitive call. I'd encourage everyone to, to connect with these research associates um, throughout the conference. And I think what they're doing, uh, and you can, you can learn more about the specific topics, is that they're, they're really, through these case studies, building the evidence for understanding mechanisms, challenges, opportunities, for how SDGs can be informed by science in the Global South. And I think this is a really critical piece of, uh, of evidence that we need if we're going to advance uh, on how SCI can, can inform um, SDGs. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Florence. It's really, um, we know that um, IDRC is really operating for a while for promoting science for development and the arrival of SDGs, not by chance, but it's really aligned. So thank you very much. And it's wonderful to, s to hear from you that SDGs are part of the science ecosystem you want to implement and really empowering people. And the participation for today is wonderful. Thank you very much. So we move now for the next speaker, Daya Reddy from ISC. 10 minutes, please. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to participate in this plenary session. So uh, the, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals encapsulate in a systematic way the major global social, economic, and environmental issues that confront humanity. We know that. Poverty eradication in all its forms and dimensions, including extreme poverty, is the greatest global challenge. It's been sort of lifted out in that way. But let's consider the breadth of the SDGs. In addition to poverty, we have water, energy, work, inequality, gender, peace, governance, partnerships. So this is the context in which we would hope to build an effective science policy interface. It's clear that this broad spectrum of areas requires integrated thinking in shaping actions that address the goals. From the mobilization of disciplinary expertise across the natural and social sciences and the humanities, we are dealing with people after all, through to transdisciplinary approaches in co-designing and co-executing plans together with the private sector, with government, and various organs of civil society. So what do we mean by the role of science advice? One might imagine scenarios in which the issues framing the advice are neatly defined and packaged with clear boundaries and desired outcomes, and that we have an obvious set or sets of policymakers who stand ready to be informed, to receive our wisdom, if you like, and who fully understand the scientific background and societal implications. So 
take climate as an example, uh, we would then proceed in a rather simple sequential fashion. What is the case for anthropogenic climate change? What is the evidence? What is the nature of the consensus? What are the implications for policy, for our future survival? Policy on what? Water, food, uh, food security, health, and so on. This problem framing is quite tidy. It's too tidy, in fact. It presupposes a willingness of policymakers to engage in the manner that's been suggested. It presupposes a degree of preparedness or capacity of science communities in the regions or countries concerned to undertake the advising. And in, this, in the case of this example, at least, having a firm grip, grasp of the multidimensional impact and the various ramifications of climate change. So this simplistic example highlights, mostly by omission, key ingredients which are absolutely essential for an informed and productive interface between scientists and policymakers. There are three that I wish to highlight. One is to understand what we are working with, that is in relation to the SDGs. Secondly, to understand who we are as scientists and potential advisors. And thirdly, to understand the relevance of broader society in developing an effective interface with policymakers. So first, with regard to understanding what we are working with, the neat packaging of the Sustainable Development Goals masks their complexity and their strong interrelatedness. Without a deep understanding of this interrelatedness, there is a danger of embarking on approaches that lead to conflict between different goals. For example, trade-offs between overcoming poverty on the one hand and moving towards sustainability. Actions to meet one target could have unintended consequences for others. On the other hand, there's a positive side also. An understanding of linkages allows for synergies and co-benefits to be identified and to be leveraged. These are some of the issues that have been explored in a major report by ICSU, the International Council for Science, one of the predecessor organizations of the International Science Council. A report on interactions among the uh, SDG goals and targets. This extremely laudable project is, in a sense, the beginning. There is a great deal more work that needs to be done in this domain. The second issue is that the 169 targets that underpin the 17 goals are not at all perfect. Another outstanding report published in 2016 jointly by ICSU and the International Social Science Council, the other predecessor organization of the Science, International Science Council, reviews the goals and targets. It's still, I think, the only such review of its kind, and finds, for example, that just under a third of the targets are well-defined and based on the latest scientific evidence, that 17% are weak or non-essential, that rather than relying on hard, measurable, quantitative outcomes, many of the targets are framed around vague language, qualitative language. As a prerequisite to an effective science policy interface, it's essential that we augment our scientific and disciplinary expertise with a thorough understanding of the interrelationships among the goals and targets, with steps to address their shortcomings, and, in fact, to maximize and to exploit the synergies that exist among them. I move to uh, my second point uh, about understanding who we are as potential advisors. In considering the nuts and bolts of science advice, we have to be aware that countries vary significantly in the robustness and maturity of their science systems, their capacity to exploit scientific knowledge, and therefore their ability to be full participants in the global scientific enterprise. As a global community, we have to work towards a truly inclusive approach to addressing the SDGs, one in which marginalized and vulnerable countries and communities, such as many countries in the global south, 
far from being excluded, become full partners, are able to benefit from and indeed to contribute to contemporary scientific advances and which have science bodies and systems that are recognized, respected, well organized and well placed to engage at the science policy interface. My third point is about policymakers in society. Policymakers are part of broader society as are we scientists for that matter. The views of policymakers are influenced by sentiment within broader society so that the context of science for policy is one that cannot disregard the public's take on science or the issues of the day. The challenge goes, the challenge goes way beyond promoting a better understanding of science among the general public. We live, as we have heard this morning, in a world of skepticism, if not outright hostility to science, to the views of what are regarded as intellectual elites, a post-truth world, a world of alternative facts. We cannot ignore this contextual reality in our engagements with policymakers. So, rather than treating science advice and public engagement as two important but distinct responsibilities, these two should go hand in hand, together with combating the challenges to science. Rather than being dismissive of campaigns or opinions that are antagonistic to science, we should first understand why this is so and go beyond being an echo chamber in which we voice to fellow scientists our alarm, our horror at the anti-scientific sentiments. So in a multi-pronged approach, we would promote the value of science, but also the values of science, the primacy of knowledge over dogma or opinion, an understanding of its power and its limitations, and above all, engender trust. This is absolutely key. Without trust, we'll get nowhere. So who's going to do all of this? What exactly are we going to do? Um, the challenge that are, challenges that I've alluded to require actions at all levels, at the global, regional, right down to national and local levels. Given the global nature of the Sustainable Development Goals, it's more important than ever that the scientific community act in a coherent manner at the global level. The International Science Council was established last July from a merger of ICSU, the International Council for Science, and the International Social Science Council. It is the largest non-governmental science organization which straddles the natural and social sciences in its membership. The Council has identified a number of key strate uh, strategic priorities. It has a unique ability to mobilize, to convene the global community in addressing these. In relation to our topic for discussion this morning, I would simply highlight two of those. One is promoting the use of scientific evidence to inform policy at all levels of governance. And as we've heard, INSA operates under the auspices of the Science Council, but the two are working actively towards closer integration uh, of their activities and strategies. And then secondly, the SDGs is an area of focus. So here the Council is uniquely placed to support the agenda, given its global reach, its presence at regional levels, and the spread of disciplines. And in fact, more or less as I speak, we are giving substance to these objectives by determining very concrete actions, and I hope towards the end or at the end of the meeting tomorrow to say a little bit more about the work of the Council. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daya. It's um, advocating for the integrated thinking and the underlying multi-dimensional things. It's really in line with what has been uh, presented by Helen earlier. And uh, we have to move again uh, to overcome some kind of conflict between goals. And we should go ahead and to nurture again uh, SDGs. So we are moving together with the action taken by co-production, co-design, co is key. So we uh, are moving to the third speaker, uh, Nakamura-san. Um, he is presenting his view, and 10 minutes again. again. 
Thank you, Harayama san. Uh, good morning. It's uh, really an honor to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this panel. Uh, this year, I have, have been appointed as a member of the Temeba group uh, that uh, give uh, advices uh, to techn uh, technology facilitation mechanism of the United Nations for SDR, for SDGs. And uh, so this morning, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, some of my lesson learned uh, during the interaction with uh, uh, the United Nations, uh, Japanese government, industry, and uh, academia. Uh, three years have already passed uh, since the adoption of the SDGs at the General Assembly of the United Nations. Uh, time uh, flies so fast. So, uh, these are, as you uh, say, the holistic and uh, bottom-up uh, activities to attain sustainable and inclusive uh, development. We have never had such an agenda in human history. It reflects the severe reality, such as uh, climate changes, endless consumption of resources, uh, damages in biodiversity, inequality, and so forth, as Helen mentioned. Our hope is that the SDGs, cont SDGs contribute to transform society, industry, and human lives to meet the, to, to meet the goals by 2030. We witnessed that the groundbreaking innovations occur, one, once after one after another, and transforming the world. The example shown here are fundamental and uh, general purpose disruptive innovations, which are followed by divergent innovations. So we may call them uh, STEM uh, innovations. Among them, digital innovations are opening a new era. A smartphone is not just a phone, it is a tool to connect the real world to cyber world and to provide a variety of services to us. So we have technologies and the fundamental innovations already. Combining them with local needs, we can achieve new innovations. Innovation by definition is to create values, new values with new combinations. It is particularly important for inclusive development. The example of the left side is a solar kiosk developed by Digital Grid or Wasana using solar power and electronic money on your smartphone. Millions of people in Kenya and the neighboring countries can access to electricity for the first time. The right hand is the mother, uh, mother and a baby, charming baby, in a safe, long-lasting mosquito net called Oiset. Uh, all set net developed and marketed by Sumitomo Chemical, which prevents uh, malaria infection. There are plenty of possibility for SDI for SDGs. Key elements are business model, finance, capacity building, and diplomacy. This is a quick uh, reflection of the third SDI forum held in June this year. New technologies for future innovation was, uh, uh, were one of the main topics. What the United Nations agencies and the member countries should do to maximize the benefit and minimize the risk was a core discussion. Exchange of knowledge and practices were really encouraged. Implementation of STI for SDG roadmap was also discussed in depth, and some examples were introduced. After the forum, the IATT Interagency Task Team of the United Nations decided to release a guidebook for implementation of STI for SDG roadmap. That will come soon. Also discussed are uh, engaging multi stakeholders innovation with local indigenous knowledge, online platform, impact investment, and others. And the summary was reported at the 
last high level political forum by Cochilla's ambassadors, Hoshino and Salvador uh, Medi earlier. From this backdrop, we identify political agenda for SDF for SDGs. Well, one, first, uh, integrating SDF for SDG strategies in the national development plans. And two, establishing a platform venue for multi-stakeholder dialogue. Also to co-design and to create transforming of transformation of society. Three, development, developing a methodology and practices for implementation of SDF or SDGs roadmaps and others. As a whole, as a whole, scaling up SDI for SDG is our common challenges. SDGs are bottom-up uh, activities towards 2030. Not only government, but industry, academia, NPOs, and citizens are engaged to transform our society by their own wills. However, we think that we may better coordinate such diverse activities so that we can secure the achievement of the whole goals to do so, government has key roles. It is important to establish a national development plan which has STI strategies as integral elements. It is possible by close collaboration with science community, business sectors, and society. The United Nations also has a number of agencies to support it. SDF SDGs implementation process includes foresight, horizon scanning, and synergy trade of analysis, such as done by X and ESR. Then we identify target domains and mission followed by, uh, and missions followed by gap analysis, co-design, collaborative actions, monitoring, and reviewing, as, and restart a new cycle. It is a circular process which is facilitated using a roadmap. Japan has launched a SDGs promotion headquarters in 2016, chaired by the Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. And recently, the government is materializing principles for STI for SDG roadmap. Uh, this is a tentative principle uh, describing the role of the government for developing roadmap, roadmaps at national and international levels. Importantly, the item five says, government intends to take a lead to create a platform where multi-stakeholders can dialogue, have dialogues, co-design, and co-create STF for SDGs. It's a really encouraging statement. So oh, these are some representative domains uh, we are thinking. Among them, countermeasures for recent climate changes and rapid, rapidly aging should be of highest priority in Japan. To proceed, we need uh, to share a sense of crisis. We need to share clear vision and long-term commitment of multi-stakeholders, in particular, in particular industry. We need to share roadmaps for coordinating multi-stakeholders' activities coherently and tracking progresses. At the STI forums in 2016, 2017, uh, it was agreed that STI roadmaps and action plans are needed at the national, national, and global levels, and should include measures for tracking. Then the STI for SDG roadmap had been discussed uh, at 2017 in Chung workshop and EGM expert group meeting Tokyo and the DCI forum 
2018. We would like to have the uh, roadmaps first at national levels, and then we'll go to the international roadmaps. Japan would like to share practices with member countries from Ramon. So in concluding, I discussed the implementation of SDR for SDGs at national levels, but I couldn't touch on the foresight on the society beyond 2030. SDG 2030 is just a passing point. Uh, beyond that, we have another uh, decade we have to think about. And also, the, I think the island system for the 21st century should change to meet the uh, societal expectation. This is also very important. And last but not least, I'd like to mention that preparedness, concreteness, and reliability of evidence-based science advice is pretty much expected. And to do so, and also the ecosystem for evidence-based policy making is important, uh, including policy makers, and science, academia, industry, and others. And the follow-up and the evaluation system of science advice is important. If we can do all, the, all of them, we can get trust. Or trustfulness yeah, relation with policy makers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nakamura san. And at, with the last slide, we come back on the notion of the ecosystem thinking. And it was really wonderful to have at the le top level SDGs from the United Nations and the international level and also national level, but you, you are not forgetting more bottom-up actions. So we will talk about these points uh, then the discussion. So last speaker, close times from the World Bank. 10 minutes. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much for this great invitation. I want to uh, build on what uh, Professor Nakamura mentioned. Um, in some way, we are sort of at stage one of trying to implement the uh, promise of the SDG. So it's important to ask sort of what has the journey been like? Uh, what are some of the challenges and where do we see the opportunities? So let me first uh, just say uh, one word about why we in the World Bank Group actually care deeply about this. We are an organization that has um, a global reach and a global mission to eradicate and bring down extreme poverty to 3% by the year 2030, uh, and to also lift up the prosperity of the bottom 40% in every country. It is an organization that is AAA rated. It lends uh, $65 billion uh, per year um, to governments. Uh, it co-invests with the private sector. Uh, and it provides political risk insurance. The World Bank Group also has a global mandate, so we are very much focused on generating data for evidence base, and we have a um, strong interest in convening multiple stakeholder groups. It is an organization that has 15,000 staff that work literally across uh, every developing country uh, and in every sector, from urban to rural, agricultural research, renewable energy, transport, water, social protection, human development, trade and investment. And given the enormity of financing, uh, one of the first points to, of course, make is that we are very interested in crowding in the private sector. Since um, it so happens that um, my 30-year tenure at the World Bank comes to a close at the end of November, I thought it's uh, opportune to actually reflect on my own personal involvement in, in this uh, mission. Um, the first one was to make the case that the World Bank should actually adopt and sign up to the MDGs in 2001. A second one was to reappraise the World Bank's knowledge strategy with a particular focus on global data, implementation knowledge, and partnerships. And the third one was to convince our then managing director, Sri Mulyani, that um, we should actually sign up together with the UN uh, to implement 
the STI uh, as a second means for achieving the SDGs. This was a very much uh, an, a novel concept for the World Bank at that time because we were very much focused on maximizing finance for development. And then uh, the final one is, um, or the last but one is for the last couple of years, I've been particularly focused on technology and innovation, in particular in Africa and North Africa, building ecosystems, innovation and entrepreneurship, particularly in the areas of climate change, agro-industries and entrepreneurship. And then finally, sort of to close my career at the bank, uh, I went to our leadership to sort of say disruptive technology is an area where we as the World Bank really need to take a corporate position. We're doing a lot, uh, but unfortunately we have not been really able to articulate precisely what we see as these fundamental changes. So thinking back, since 2015, what have we accomplished? We have expanded the collaboration with the UN system. We have conducted jointly uh, the first review of all global STI programs that the UN is doing. Um, it has been a real eye-opener to sort of see how much the UN and the global community is doing, but it actually pales in comparison what bilateral and regional organizations are doing. We have very successfully and consistently engaged with uh, Japan over the last year and a half, and I want to just uh, call out Professor Arimoto, Dr. Otake, and uh, Professor Nakamura for their leadership in this one to build a common narrative, because 2019 is a year of considerable opportunity at the global level. We have worked on building a community of STI champion countries, um, and we have developed in the World Bank Group an aspirational value proposition around disruptive technologies for development, and these really uh, address some of the fundamental change drivers that we see in the future around platforms, around new opportunities for expanding access to those that currently don't have access, the changing nature of work and the role of uh, automation, the need for skill development, and then finally, a very big question around how do we reinvent and uh, reset the social contract in a world where trust and institution is uh, fraying. What have we accomplished in this one? My own personal assessment is that we have recognized that we need to move way beyond fragmentation and duplication at the international level so the supply side is not optimally positioned. We need a coherent framework through SCI for SDG roadmaps, and that is a framework that requires IOs, bilaterals, private sector, indigenous knowledge providers to actually work hand in hand. We need to reorient the SCI agenda as the first order of importance on implementation at the country level. And we need to elevate the decision, the dialogue to decision makers at the political level. And that means really going beyond the ministries of science and ICT. In terms of where are we, uh, we have taken uh, a lot of information in over the last year and a half in terms of looking at different methodologies. And uh, as I think everyone has said, the idea that the idea that STI for SDG roadmaps would just fall from the sky is, of course, a complete uh, illusion because this is such a novel concept that there's up to now very little evidence of how this could actually be done. There are, of course, countries like China and India that have done this effectively, but for the most part, the confusion between national development plans, STI plans, and SDG plans is making it very difficult to have a uh, language that uh, all three communities actually understand. So that is clearly something that we found to be lacking, and it is making it very difficult to have a coherent conversation between science, technology, and uh, the innovation community, as well as policymakers. The stock taking has shown that there is absolutely no shortage of methodologies. Um, on several countries have developed these strategies, various UN and international organizations, UNESCO, UNCTAD, WIPO, UN, UNEP, UNDP, the World Bank assist countries with diagnostics and strategies. The scientific community and the networks that they support have um, developed really interesting methodologies, NASEM, the Inter-Academies Partnership, IEA, and of course, ICSU. And there is an increasing attention on the role of foresight, which several of us have already mentioned today. But the assessment that I have uh, drawn is that, unfortunately, most of them are focused on advanced countries. Uh, most don't meet the criteria for stakeholder engagement scenarios. Uh, target setting, implementation, technology scanning, and there is a real need for robust guidance to policymakers if you really want to reach them. And this is sort of a, um, a preliminary analysis in terms of what we have seen some of the gaps, and they are really interesting because from a static point of view, some of the strengths, this is sort of referring to seven countries uh, where we have just recently reviewed their STI plans, Indonesia, Colombia, Kenya, Thailand, Ethiopia, Sri Lanka, and Jamaica. 
And what struck me when I looked at this is really some of the gap areas, uh, scanning of changes in the global context, trade-offs and desirable pathways, uh, potential challenges of disruptive technologies, explicit explanation of what kind of technical expertise was actually used, and exp explicit discussion of the implementation plans for how STI could help accomplish the SDGs, and then very importantly, the lack of a feedback mechanism to update these plans and to make sure that they remain relevant. In terms of simplifying this, this is a very similar to what Professor Nakamura presented in terms of what we are trying to get to with this uh, set of uh, roadmaps is really to uh, reset our own internal understanding of how do we use the key inputs around stakeholder consultation, expertise, and data to inform a discussion around defining objectives. Often we start with developing the vision. Uh, well, defining objectives and scope is probably a much more realistic assessment. Um, and it actually gives us a much better sense of how we calibrate the effort. A really important point is assessing alternative pathways. It is not necessarily the frontier technologies that we are looking at. We are actually looking at available technologies. If you consider that most of agriculture is 2% of the global, uh, away from the uh, uh, global productivity frontier, there is a huge amount that could actually be uh, uh, done to, to accomplish this. And then a final point, really important, is the monitoring and evaluating of making sure that we actually update these, uh, these plans. Um, I want to talk about a, a couple of four opportunities that I see. Um, the first one is really just a statement that the search for a sustainable development solution is at the center of global, national, and local debates. And in fact, the aspirations for inclusive and sustainable development have become universal. There's a broad consensus on the critical fault lines for the future of humanity, and I think those are the five areas, climate change, jobs, and the changing nature of work, inclusive development, in particular as far as gender is concerned, fragility, peace, and security, and finally, trust in governance and institutions. Now, the prospects for disruptive technology and scientific advances have actually become a major catalyst for change, probably more so than at any time of our lifetime. I read in the uh, background note that science diplomacy is entering a new era, and I noticed that the motivation of scientists to contribute to development solutions is at an all-time high. So clearly, this is a good moment in time to, to have this conversation. Likewise, particularly the work on disruptive technologies has fundamentally changed uh, the way and the certainty with which we were thinking about traditional development pathways. So the development community itself is actually undergoing a massive rethink of what it can do to contribute. So that raises the question of what is that new compact between the development community and the SCI community going forward? And what are the future-oriented discussions that we should be having together? The third area is the search for new solutions. And we have seen uh, in the last year and a half uh, really a, quite an explosion of new partnerships. For instance, the Famine Action Network on digital identity cards, innovation-friendly regulation, uh, off-grid energy, data privacy, these are very much the topics that we need to come up with solutions now. Um, I think the role of youth and women to champion inclusive innovation, particularly from a bottom building perspective, is, is absolutely something that we want to uh, see um, pushing further. And the appreciation for a custom tailored menu in terms of country level implementation, I think is one that uh, we need a lot more further development on. What works in the Pacific is unlikely to be relevant for Brazil, but nevertheless, there's a lot of learning that can take place across these. So how do we actually then join forces with the science policy community? And finally, 2019 is really a year of opportunity. Uh, it is a year where, uh, under Japan's leadership, the topic of STI is going to be raised at the G20 level. It is a major topic of discussion in the convention uh, around TICAT, where all the African heads of state and leaders are coming to, uh, to Japan. It is an opportunity for Prime Minister Abe to actually represent uh, the UN STI community in terms of reporting back on SDGs progress. And it is an opportunity to call for a stronger and uh, a renewal of a mandate at the global level. When the SDGs were first adopted, I don't think any one of us had really a clear sense of what disruptive technologies might look like. So there's a real question of what is that international roadmap and what could happen after 2019. And I think the idea that we are going to be working through networks collectively with key actors and at the country as well as international level, I think is the one part of this agenda that is really motivating. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Klaus. Um, we see that World Bank is moving far beyond traditional role for development and taking fully advantage of the power SDI and really at the same time promoting SDI for development. Uh, we see there um, um, some coherence among speakers, you, uh, having common narrative, uh, not just having a list of goals but taking action in a coherent way. And we have to go in depth in thinking about the SDGs too. So now we are moving to the discussion, but first of all, I will turn to Helen, uh, because you will not have keynote speech. And you mentioned uh, at the beginning that you are kind of um, concept designer of SDGs. So you, you, you have been engaged from the beginning. And uh, since 2016 to now, you see many things happen, happening, and also many actions at different level, from national level, international organization level, but also from action from the ground, and there we are in enveloping uh, people in the way to really uh, promote SDGs. What is your view on this observation? Mm. Well, firstly, as head of UNDP, I did a lot of advocacy around you know, what the sustainable development goals could be. And as I indicated uh, early on in my speech, uh, my view, and I think this was the view of many in development, was that you needed uh, few goals and they needed to be measurable. And we didn't end up with that because member states negotiated the agenda and no one wanted to leave anything out and hence we get 17 goals, 169 targets and 222 indicators. And uh, what uh, Di already said is, is absolutely right. Many of these targets are not actually measurable at all. A lot of them simply political statements, but, but it is what it is. And you know, none of us, I think, are in disagreement with the general direction, which is we want to try to you know, continue to advance human development and human security, particularly for the, the many who are currently uh, missing out altogether. But we would like to be able to achieve that without trashing the planet any further and actually trying to restore uh, or remediate uh, uh, a lot of the damage that, that has already been done. Uh, so where, where are we at now? Well, you know, the global community takes a while to mobilise around things. And one of my concerns, I suppose, in 2015 was that you know, you'd have the big summit and the leaders would sign off on it and then it would go back into the bottom drawer uh, because you know, other events overtook it and new agendas and, and so on. Now, uh, I mean, I, I don't think progress on the goals has been spectacular at all. In fact, as I indicated in a number of areas, the trends are in the reverse. On the other hand, because there was a, a lot of engagement around the the formulation of the goals, you have, I think, a lot more awareness about them than you had at the start of the Millennium Development Goal era, where there was a feeling that they were handed down from on high and there hadn't been uh, broad engagement uh, in, in drawing them up. So the you know, level of awareness is higher, uh, but I think it may have been uh, Peter Gluckman who said earlier, um, is there more than lip service with a lot of governments? A lot of governments I think, yes, 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 SDGs, but is there actually a strategy to achieve them? And we see a, a number of countries coming to the high-level global, high-level political forum on the SDGs in New York each July now, and they always all want to present on the SDGs, but a number are presenting with no strategy to achieve them at all. And it seems to me, if you don't have a strategy, then it's quite hard to, to know whether you're making any any, any progress or not. Uh, now, with the, the MDGs, for a range of reasons, I don't think there was really a lot of mobilisation until the last five or six years. But this agenda is so much bigger and more complicated that if it's left to the last five or six years, that will be quite disastrous. So I think just you know keeping uh, the, the debate about the SDGs alive are, are very much attracted by the very systematic uh, approaches that we've we've seen here from Japanese presentation and also uh, World Bank on uh, how to you know really develop the STI for SDG concept. I think 
I think really from the STI perspective, you can be a, a constant you know, voice, if you like, for approaching this in a, in a systematic way uh, and, and following through. Uh, as well as making the obvious point that the SDGs are a very complex agenda in themselves, bear in mind that the international community keeps throwing other agendas at countries as well. So you have the SDGs here, you have the Paris and Climate Agreement here, you have the Sendai Agreement Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction here, you have the new urban agenda from Quito. And you know, even for countries with high, high capacity, this is a lot to absorb. And uh, one of the things we used to endeavour to do at, at UNDP was to say to countries, well, don't have you know, a whole lot of different vertical silos for trying to achieve these things. Take, take your national development plan, take each of these agendas and, and try to incorporate them and look for the common ground and principles because if you're pursuing those, that just those four separate agendas and vertical silos as well as your own national development plan, you'll spend so much time you know, writing reports that you never get on to any, any action at all. So uh, tr trying to, to keep it simple, keep a focus. Uh, another of the mantras around the SDGs was that, you know, that everything in them is important and you can't cherry pick goals and targets. Well, you know, I've been a Prime Minister, you can't have 17 goals and 169 targets that you simultaneously advance. You do actually have to prioritise year to year. You know, Malaysia at one point had a um, development um, way of talking about development that said uh, something like big wins now, or big gains now, but basically picking, this is what we're going to go after now. And I think particularly for least developed countries, where often everything is a challenge, right? Everything needs to be done. You can't do it all. You, you have to prioritise. So, so what are the things that are going to be most important in the sequence of moving forward? What will be the things you can do that ha can have the greatest multiplier effects? I think we need to be quite practical about this. Yes, everything is important, but you can't do it all at once. Thank you very much, based on your experience as a prime minister. And it's really huge challenges. At the same time, as you mentioned, we need to be pragmatic, to be practical on the ground, and uh, we have to go beyond the conflict and the competitions among different policies. I'm turning to there, because you mentioned uh, among goals, some conflict may arise. So to be positive side, uh, how, what would be your suggestion to overcome these uh, different directions, moving in different directions, but you have to have some coherence response for the policy side and advocate for take action from the ground. So what would be your suggestion? Um, yes, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, as, as somebody indicated, we are into year three or thereabouts in this 15 year period that it's 20% you know, of the time gone. And here we are saying, well, the, the, the targets are not perfect um, in, in various ways. Um, I, I, did, I did, in mentioning the work that uh, ICSA previously and the International Science, Social Science Council rather had done, indicated that, that this really is the beginning. You know, if, if you go back to the interactions report, uh, what that report did was to take a particular subset, it didn't take everything, it couldn't, um, of the set of goals and targets and to examine very carefully the interactions. There is a great more to be done, uh, work to be done, in um, really uh, almost taking a systems or network kind of approach in getting a good grip on the nature of the interactions. And as I said, there, but there are potentially negative interactions, but there are various synergies that we should be aware of. That, that is the one side of it. So there's a great deal of work to be done there. And certainly the International Science Council, given its global reach, is in a good position to ensure that that work continues. And that certainly would be part of our, our agenda. The, the other side of it has to do with, with um, promoting awareness, in other words, a better understanding of exactly what the goals are, exactly what the targets are, what the interactions are, the conflicts and, and the like, particularly um, 
policymakers, but others as well, who, who are involved in developing strategies for addressing the goals w without having such a proper understanding, we are likely to, um, to have to contend with conflicts, we are likely to miss out on valuable synergies and the like. So that's the, that would be the other side of it. Thank you very much. Uh, Matthew, you are mostly close to the ground because you're acting directly with the developing countries and really putting into actions all these goals. How do you see this kind of different goals coming in to you? It's uh, facilitating your task or it's more constraining for your actions? How do you see from the practical point of view? Yeah, I mean, a very good question. The, I can, you know, I can speak sort of uh, from two perspectives. One, um, in terms of IDRC's own programming, the goals are extremely helpful. And having um, documents such as the ones looking at interactions and looking at, you know, how these, what are some of the trade-offs and how do these goals sort of connect and what kind of synergies can be had are, are extremely useful for our own programming. Now, when we work with for example, the, the uh, granting councils in, in sub-Saharan Africa, um, there's where there's, it's much more challenging. Um, in, in a lot of low- and middle-income countries, there just isn't the, the capacity in terms of both the, the funding side and the, the science advice side to really um, sink in, you know, get, you know, sink your teeth into to some of the SDGs. And, and as we just said, they're, they're being uh, bombarded <laughs> so to speak, with lots of other, other priorities, uh, lots of other goals, not to mention sort of uh, domestic domestic priorities, so having to balance all that. So I think, I mean, the, the, the trend I'm, I'm, some of the trends that, that can counter that is, is regional collaboration, especially smaller countries being able to, to partner with each other to, for example, launch common uh, joint calls on uh, an, an SDG that's of particular interest to them. And really being able to to identify what are the what are the, some of the big wins, and transfer that into a into a research program or into some kind of research activity. So I think we really need to take stock of it a bit more. But uh, but but I think we're starting to understand some of the challenges that are that are being faced for lower and middle income countries. Thank you. Uh, listening to Nakamura-san and uh, Klaus from a World Bank point of view. It's really uh, systematically you are already preparing the ground uh, for the implementations and also gathering uh, people's ideas. Uh, it seems very from the s s to simplify, quite easy to tackle these issues. I guess it is not the case. So could you explain to us uh, what's the barrier you encounter within your we big institution such as World Bank, uh, Japanese government, United Nations. So, based on experience, what's what you had to really overcome no. to really setting up to have a consensus among roadmap and action plans? So, could you just explain some? Really? Thank you. Uh, before going into the roadmap and related discussion there, I'd like to just mention a, a one, one important area, that's the aging society. It's not uh, well described or targeted in the SDGs of, mm. of today. The 2050, we have 40% uh, above uh, 65 years old in Japan. And some studies in Europe, China, Korea, Singapore, everywhere. So we have to add that uh, in SDGs. And that is a, a discussion we have in Japan. But uh, anyway, so uh, the roadmap is not a new uh, topic. A industry has, has been doing uh, their business based on their roadmaps. Uh, they revise uh, their roadmaps every five years, every three years, five years, or 10 years. 
and also the small uh, uh, institutes or, or uh, local uh, governments, they do have roadmaps. But at the national or international levels, it's very, very challenging as you observe. But if you go into the government, government of Japan, the Ministry of uh, Science, Ministry of uh, Trade, Industrial Trade, Ministry of Environment, they do have some, some roadmaps indiv individually, but all of them were not completely combined. No uh, unified roadmap exists, for, for instance, in Japan. So the challenge today, uh, our challenge today in Japan is we do have a cabinet office which has the power to consolidate all the efforts of the ministry, relevant ministry. So we ask the cabinet office to have a national level roadmap for selected very prioritized domains. And we, uh, science community, can make advice to them. That, that's our understanding. But the next step is international roadmap. It's more challenging. No framework at this moment. So World Bank, uh, JST, and other uh, agencies are now starting discussion how to uh, formulate uh, international uh, maps. And it's, uh, I hope it, it is coming, discussion is coming very soon there in depth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I guess to sort of to be a little bit systematic on this one, the first one is you, if you don't have leadership within an organization, of course, the chances are zero, right? So you, of course, know how to build a burning platform around this. So this is number one. The second one, assuming that you are actually effective and people in an organization don't turn into cynics about the next new thing, uh, the shining object, um, it's really important that you constantly work on this balance between what you need to do internally and what you need to do uh, externally. And I think this, this whole work around disruptive technology has been fascinating because I've been involved in many change processes. This is probably the one that took the shortest amount of time, 10 months. It involved absolutely no reorganizations, uh, no upheaval, no cynicism. Um, but it has now started a whole movement in terms of we need to change our country diagnostic. We need to have a much different way of financing. And of course, we have defined and recognized, we had to recognize, a lot of important gaps around skills, around outreach. And I just want to mention that it's one thing for uh, an organization of economists to embrace technology and innovation. You notice that I have been very scant in terms of how I see and appraise our involvement in science. We don't have a science council. I'm not advocating that we should. But we should be much more relying on scientific knowledge in our work particularly in the, in the real sector, but I would say across the board, I'm, I'm really concerned that we are still not entirely focused and fully appraised of what is around the corner. So for an economist to actually go and sort of let go of forecasting and embrace foresight is much more than just changing the word at the margin. It is a really different way of embracing alternative futures. And then um, in my exit interview with uh, our CEO, I, I basically said, we have been very successful on stage one. Now let me give you four three fears that I have for stage two in terms of implementing. The first one is the fear of ignorance, that we actually don't know what we are uh, embracing. The second one is the fear of guesswork. Uh, the, the need for evidence is so compelling, and we need to have this. Uh, we can't just make random choices. And then the final one is the fear of diffusion, which is what Helen mentioned. Is, is we are constantly uh, bombarded with new requests, and, and keeping a focused mandate uh, is, is absolutely a, a primary challenge of the leadership of an organization, because otherwise we are doing everything and then we are doing nothing. Thank you. It's really not only advocating outside, but you have to work inside yes. too. I think the same for everybody, everybody of you. And I think also that um, when you want to bring changes in the direction SDGs, it's not just setting up goals, but you need to have process. And you need to have a strategy for the transition management. That's more difficult yes. because you have your own habits 
your own way of doing businesses, and you have to change that and ensure that no one left behind. That's not for sure for everybody, and that's difficult. Um, time is running, so I, I would like to ask to all of you um, a question, uh, because we talk about many action from the top down in some sense, but we see all of you, your conscience about more bottom up, bringing young researchers within today, and other SMEs uh, may be part of the story, not only big companies and so on. So, so uh, I, I, will, I would like to ask you, um, observing that many bottom up actions are burgeoning on the ground, um, what is from your perspective how the government or international institutions like World Bank could leverage these initiatives to achieve overall goal of SDGs? It's really, you have to really not separate one, uh, not only just alignment, but action together on the ground. It's more, most difficult. And if you have some tips or concern about, I would like to have your view on that. So any of you, I would like to have many ideas for that. Who wants please have <laughs> Well, I think really thinking in the way the sustainable <laughs> development agenda encourages us to think uh, needs to instill at the very least a new way of doing things. That when we think about how we move, whether it's as a government, uh, a set of advisors, a university, an institution, a company, whatever it is, that if we have at the forefront of our minds that inclusion and sustainability are very important principles, that will lead us to act in, in certain ways. And I was reflecting as you asked that, that question, uh, you know, going, going back earlier in life, did we have you know, th those as things at the very top of our mind when we thought about how things were, were organised, that the importance of diversity, of taking into account many perspectives, of acknowledging that the populations are, uh, are very diverse, there are many views that somehow, you know, we, we must engage with all of that. So, yeah, it's a, it's a way of doing things differently, I think, that is the, the first principle. And then that opens you to you know, incorporating many, many more perspectives. I also wanted to come back really to the, one of the first questions you asked, which was to Professor Reddy on, uh, you know, where could, you know, actions be in conflict and, and you know, put the goals in conflict. And of course, the m most obvious example, and there are many, uh, uh, if the desire is to have energy for all, then <laughs> the rolling out of the, you know, the, the coal plants fast <laughs> is one way of achieving that. But it, it's going to completely throw your ability to meet other goals, let alone when large countries do that, the, the impact it has uh, globally on, on sustainability. And, and that leads me to make the, the point that if, uh, if we expect developing countries to do things differently and sustainably, there's got to be a huge commitment to technology transfer to do that. Uh, you, you know, there, there are sustainable and renewable technologies, but are they accessible? Are they affordable? Uh, are countries able to you know, uh, adapt quickly, get the finance for it? You know, the, these are very, very big issues. And if you are a poor person without energy, it's not of great interest to you whether it comes from a coal-powered plant or a wind turbine. It happens to matter in the big scheme of things. So if it matters enough to you know, to those with power and influence, when we'd better make it possible to do it in a sustainable way. Otherwise, we will be at odds uh, across the goals and not be thinking holistically about how, how we achieve things. Thank you. In this way, I would just add uh, the way we do tech transfer from developing, country, uh, developed country to developing countries. Uh, we have to be, go beyond the traditional view and then think about inclusive innovation through our innovation and think first from the, from the ground. And then uh, it's not only high tech, high spec, scientifically uh, newly trended uh, technology, but to really make sure that it's useful on the ground, you need to have much, much scientific knowledge 
to make sure that uh, it's cost effective and solid and really operational. I, I guess reflecting on your, your question, I think we all have a lot of examples both from high income countries and lower income countries where you know pockets have been have really taken the SDGs to heart and, and uh, if we think of you know researchers or, or, or SMEs have been able to, to achieve results. So I guess what I would make are, are two points. One, that there, there still needs to be some way to, uh, to kind of capture that learning at a, at a, at a country level or at a, at a regional level. And, and, and I think we need, we still, even if, if we have sort of organic ground up progress, we, we still need some kind of um, system that enables a, a country to show progress and to, to continue to kind of socialize the, the, the SDGs and to, to, to essentially demonstrate some of that success and, and transfer it back uh, into maybe a more formal formal process. And the other point I'll make is that, is that there should also be some mechanisms to, to, to use those pockets and, and network them in a sense and, and to, to find ways to promote interactions between you know, SMEs that have been very successful or researchers that have been very successful uh, with, uh, with other researchers, other larger companies, other parts of civil society, et cetera. So I'd, I'd just make those two points. Thank you. Who? Nakamura-san? Yes, uh, the, in, the, in the area of uh, industry, uh, as you know, the impact uh, investment, uh, for example, ESG uh, investment is getting popular and uh, very supportive to move towards the uh, uh, SDG-related businesses. And uh, so how about the uh, academy for scientists? What, what is a new instrument to transform science community, science uh, uh, scientific activities? Uh, we need uh, some uh, consideration. For instance, a better funding system to encourage a R&D for sustainability, as an example. And uh, also, the researchers, uh, scientists are evaluated today. It's not, it's not good, or it's good, uh, by the paper, the, by their papers, uh, highly cited papers, uh, cited papers are one of the evaluation tool. And uh, if they publish papers in this area, uh, many people may, would be interested. But I'm, I'm not sure they, they have, we have a, such a good journal for sustainability science. So this is the area we have to consider. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, given to give incentive to young researchers to move in this direction. I think we have listened to the young people come inside because we will have two days discussing about these issues. Probably you can get some new ideas from that from them because we need to take action from bottom up. Thank you. You? Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I wonder if I could um, respond by um, really referring in particular to, from a pretty practical point of view, the challenges that confront countries in the developing world. Um, so I'm from South Africa. If we take Africa as an example, in a sense, there are a great many things that all have to happen at the same time. We, we can't wait for scientific communities to be sufficiently mature, shall we say, in order to get on with the business of engaging with policymakers with regard to the SDGs. It all has to happen at the same time. And how is that going to happen? Well, it's, it, it's good to know that there's an enormous amount of cooperation on the go. For example, among the network, uh, among the academies of science uh, in various African countries, some 24 of them. Um, and then also, uh, you know, you've mentioned young people. Uh, young academies are particularly active, if not more so, I would say, than senior academies, certainly in sub-Saharan Africa and perhaps in other parts of the world, particularly in areas pertaining to um, the science policy interface. I would also want to mention as particular examples um, the work of INSA in getting an African chapter going. So you know, rather than waiting for absolutely everything to be in place, 
getting moving with that, and that is certainly coming along well. And then to take another example in which um, uh, really if one is to, if, if countries are to be able to take full advantage of and to be partners in the fullest sense of um, major new technological developments, and I'm thinking here in particular about the digital revolution and the opportunities for open science and the like, then that has to happen now. So likewise, again, through the International Science Council, we have what's called an open African science platform that encapsulates infrastructure, cutting edge science, building capacity, and the like. And so, so while the challenges are, are massive, there is a lot going on, and I think that that does all go well for the future. Thank you very much, Klaus. One of the startling um, historical perspective is that two of the biggest scientific revolution, the Green Revolution and HIV AIDS uh, vaccine, took between 15 to 30 years. So your point in terms of speed is absolutely essential. We are 12 years away from it. The second one is, and that may be slightly provocative, is the poor are good business. Uh, so if you really want to involve and if you really want to change, uh, you need to understand that they are looking for an economic destiny that we are currently not providing them. So I think that's a really important driver for making changes at a big scale possible. And then the third one is, I mean, quite frankly, self-criticizing what we have done. We cannot stay passively to the digital revolution. I think we have, we have woken up too late in terms of what this means for data privacy, for platform dominance. Uh, we need to really start investing into local entrepreneurs and in local platforms. And I think particularly in Africa, I see huge potential for this. And that means for us to also let go of excessive control. We need to actually be able to convince the Minister of Agriculture in Kenya that 10% of the next agricultural operation is going to an untested proposal in terms of building up a completely new way of having a digital agricultural value chain. And I think we need examples like this. I think Rwanda is another excellent example where we're all actively learning from this. But we need to do it simultaneously and we need to do it with a lot more focus on what we are trying to accomplish. So innovation and frontier technologies for the bottom billion, I think that should be the headline for all of us. And, and I think there is huge amount of potential that we don't even recognize. Thank you so much. Uh, speed is key and the collaboration is key and also uh, digital transformation where we talk about these issues lots, lots, lots today and tomorrow and what's the implication and also, um, you know, for developing countries. By the past, our thinking was first you have to set up some infrastructure, then industry and so, so kind of development path. But today, with digital transformation, you don't need to t pass through all this path. But probably you may have opportunity to not have huge infrastructure by the past, having capacity to set up new one based on this new technology, but at the same time being careful about the impacts on the society, uh, privacy and other social structure, including democracy. So thanks so much. We have one or two questions from the audience. I'm so sorry for <laughs> taking all the time. So we have someone uh, at the top. Could you just bring microphone? Uh, and I will take two questions. Please mention name and institution on the question, please. Uh, Professor Paul Berkman, uh, Director of the Science Diplomacy Center at Tufts University. Uh, thank you for your comments. Um, feature of science is understanding time and space and change. Uh, in context, the first billion people were alive in, in 1800. By the end of the 21st century, there'll be 12 billion people on Earth. That's over a thousand percent increase in the last two centuries. Um, oldest calendars are on Earth are around 6,000 years old. The goals that you're talking about have an agenda for 2030. The question is, how do we maintain the momentum to solve problems on a planetary scale well beyond 2030? Not in terms of the 21st century, but in an objective manner across generations, which is the fundamental feature of sustainability across generations. So the question is, how do we maintain the momentum that is being initiated by all of these organizations, INCSA, the United Nations, across generations? 
you. I will take second question from this gentleman, please. The microphone, and then we will turn to you, speakers. Um, I'm Rob Moore from the uh, Gauteng City Region Observatory in Johannesburg. Um, the point has been made that um, the SDGs are uh, complex, um, interdependent, um, and we. the point has also been made is that governments are not necessarily disposed uh, in how they set themselves up um, to be readily receiving um, high quality insight and information coming from the research community. Um, one of the observations is that quite often how governments are structured in terms of particular line departments that quite often have quite strong insulations in between themselves are actually quite poorly structured uh, in order to be able to, complex, uh, to, to, to address complex systemic goals that are very often the nature of the SDGs. I wonder if any of the panelists are able to comment on how government can better structure itself, number one, to be receptive of good quality research insight, and secondly, to be working in a collaborative, transversal basis in order to address complex goals like the SDGs. Very much I shut down, I'm sorry, I'm close the question. So short answer from the first question, how we maintain the momentum beyond 2030, and how we can overcome the silo effect. Who, Helen? Answer, please. The, the first one's a, a mega question. <laughs> um, and you know, if we reflect back to 2015, when this agenda was, was set, along with a number of others, it was quite a remarkable year for uh, the international community coming together uh, around uh, uh, ver very important challenges. Could you negotiate the outcomes of the four big conferences of 2015 and 2018? Probably not, because the mood for multilateralism uh, deteriorated very, very significantly as countries and particularly some very major ones focus back on how to make themselves great, not on how we can tackle these common challenges. Uh, so in, in this you know, current immediate context, uh, getting nations to think in, in this big framing of, of how we all work together, how we work multilaterally, it, it is not so easy. But we, we can't give up on that because there is actually no solution and everyone just you know, rowing, rowing their own boat. Uh, the second point on um, on how governments can configure themselves. Look, inevitably, in any organisation, you're going to have departments, right? You're going to try and organise around particular themes, capacities, and so on. But but I think what is really needed for governments is the the high level leadership that says, okay, I appreciate we've got these departments and they've all got their perspectives and they relate to this sector of society or economy or whatever, but. I'm requiring you to come together, again, around seeking solutions to common challenges and getting the very best advice you can. And if, as I see, has developed in New Zealand across each of these departments, you're getting the, the science advisors in place. That, they're a very important network to, uh, to support that as well. But it does require leadership. Otherwise, in countries with well-established and powerful public services, there are very strong silos. Just a few words, can, please. Can I comment very quickly on, yeah. on, on the second question, Rob. Um, the shortcoming you describe is a shortcoming we find in the scientific community as well. We're getting better at it. I think we are getting to recognize the importance of working in a multidisciplinary way, in framing problems in that way. And we are more and more actively engaging in that way. Um, very briefly, I, uh, my, my suggestion would be that at the science policy interface, what we should be engaging in with government is not only informing policymakers with regard to this or that particular very specific issue, whether it's energy or whatever, but really with regard to the multifaceted and multidisciplinary way in which problems <coughs> ought to be 
considered, framed, and, and discussed. Thank you so much. With this, I will close the panel. Thank you so much for all the speakers and uh, opening the door for the discussion for the, for the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.